I was approached by Nicholas Clearbury, uh, who was the artistic director of Mid Wales Opera, and I'd known Nick uh, for some time. And so we sat in a cafe in Pimlico one lunchtime, and he said, you know, I'm thinking of doing Bizet's Carmen with uh, Mid Wales Opera in a season or two. The trouble is that it's a largish orchestra, and I don't want to do just a cut-down version of the original score. Um, how would you feel about doing an entirely new orchestration for, I think it was in the N10 instruments? Instruments like saxophone, guitar, marimba would help us do that. We joked that perhaps what we should aim for um, was a sound that might remind you of, you know, Lilis Pastia's bar on a good Saturday night with a with a band in, that it would have, uh, certainly in those sections of the opera, that it might make, make you want to get up and dance, and that it, it, that it would be far more like that than it would be 19th century chamber music. I think the Peters edition was, uh, I think it was more thrust upon us than <laughs> Uh, and I, I don't think there was any ever any question of not using the Peters edition because um, it was the it, it is the authoritative edition, mm -hmm. I, I think. Um, also, very conveniently, I'm published by Peters edition. And anyway, I mean, uh, you know, Dick Langham Smith is, if you like, the go-to man on this this piece, mm -hmm. um, and. You know, excitingly, we, uh, we we had the raw, we were going to commission a new translation from Rory Bremner as well. So there was a lot of work to be done on this, and um, uh, 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 it, it kind of keeping it under one publishing roof always it always made sense. I mean, I, I don't know what it would have been like otherwise, because we did we didn't do that. So, but this worked very well. Yes. He, like me and like Nick, um, you know, feels that works of art are malleable and they change and they don't change for the worse, they change. That we are approached to, some, uh, to, to works of art, to canonic works of art, um, is to make them relevant and to keep um, reinventing them. It's, it's very interesting because a lot of what you're saying chimed with exactly the same things as Anna Van Arden was saying mm -hmm. this morning. Um, because basically she worked with both Dick and I in workshop situations while she was developing new dialogue written by Meredith Oakes. Um, and, uh, and she said what was wonderful about working with Dick and working in that workshop way was that she was, she was comforted by the fact that we were always open to new interpretations and change and adaptation to make this um, uh, a living spectacle for a modern audience. Yeah, well I think you know that was very much at the heart of what we were doing with Mid Wales Opera, um, hence uh, asking Rory Bremner who we knew would come up with something lively yes. and we knew that some critics would find bits of it anachronistic but I mean you know if you come from a world of, of, of contemporary music you're, you're, you're used to that anyway and one of the things that is always very apparent uh, from Bizet's original is his use of colour and uh, how he, it, it's very clear and it's very specific although he doesn't evoke uh, Spanish music, there is a sense of it uh, pervading throughout the piece. So when I'd originally spoken with Nick Clearbury, the conductor, about this, and we decided on this idiosyncratic lineup, um, I used to try and imagine what it would have been like if Bizet had been presented for some reason with this group of instruments and if he'd accepted the fact that that's what he was going to have to score his opera or rescore his opera for. So I wanted to essentially uh, approach this not as a reorchestration, but as a, as, as a new piece of creation, if it, as if it was my opera. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and somehow think myself into Bizet's shoes and approach it very creatively rather than as a chore or a task or a job that something that was inherently part of the composition we were talking about this i mentioned to you earlier i'm i'm doing some teaching on the opera makers program at guildhall school um, and talking to young opera making uh, composers and writers there about how much um, stage direction they should have in their scores as a rule you have to notate and uh, make your score such that it communicates as best you can what you want but then allow space for the performer to make an interpretation and I think the the great achievement of, of Dick's version of Carmen is that it gives as much information that is, as is needed without locking things down so tightly that it doesn't allow for any other possibility. Her text is only useful, isn't it, when it inspires us to go on and create again. Um, otherwise it becomes museum. And it, 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 I think we have to assume, allow ourselves a degree of freedom. I mean, we, you know, we're not talking about changing the tunes here. Um, we're not talking about changing the harmonies, although sometimes we have some um, hard choices to make about the harmonies because there are different, in one or two places, there are different um, uh, versions, um, which is why it's very important to get as free, uh, for, 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 the, for the source material to be as available as it can be without restriction to as wide a group of people as possible so as we can all discuss it and make rational decisions. You need the confidence of a very solid Urtext edition which allows the possibility of moving even beyond that. And, and I, I feel that the score kind of uh, invites one into it in a way. Mm. It doesn't close anything down. Beyond Yeah, well, it starts a discussion, doesn't it? I mean, which we're all always happy to do, mm. uh, I, I think. I mean, providing it doesn't all get too silly. But... Um, uh, it, but the, you know, a discussion of it is healthy, but you need to have a place to start, and that needs to be authoritative.